Hello, everyone. It is now 5 p.m. here in France. Uh, I really wanted to thank each and every one of you for joining this webinar. Septodon is really pleased to welcome today Professor Malamed, who will give us a lecture about how to manage painless and successful dental anesthesia. So, as you can see, all the mics are on mute, apart from Professor Malamed and mine. But if you have uh, any questions, please do not hesitate. You can use the chat at the right of your screen. Uh, we will have about an hour presentation, and then during about half an hour, Professor Malamed will answer uh, the questions. Uh, also, please note that uh, this webinar will be recorded, so it will be available on uh, our YouTube channel. And we will send you uh, by email within 48 hours the slides that will be presented today. Again, thank you everyone for joining this webinar, and thank you especially Professor Malamed for what will be a, a very interesting presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, and welcome everybody. Um, unfortunately, of course, this is the reason we're here. Uh, the COVID-19 virus, which has basically shut down the entire planet Earth. And let me just start out by, by saying that I hope that every one of you, no matter where you are, are healthy and will remain healthy during the remainder of this ordeal, which hopefully, hopefully uh, will allow us to come back to a relatively normal type of living. Uh, I'm Stanley Malamed. I am a dentist and um, I am actually a dentist anesthesiologist. That's, but I haven't actually done dentistry since 1973. Uh, I'm a dentist anesthesiologist and uh, from 1973 until 2013, I was a professor of anesthesia at the University of Southern California School of Dentistry. I am a consultant to Septonaut. This is a disclosure saying that I am a, uh, I'm a consultant. I get paid from them. Okay, I have three textbooks. And I, I sincerely hope that everybody out there uh, has all of my new editions in my book. The Malamid family would greatly appreciate that. But we're gonna be dealing today with the, the book in the middle, which is the seventh edition of my handbook on local anesthesia. So to get to work, uh, dentistry, okay, what do we do? Uh, this restorative dentistry, let me call it bread and butter dentistry. This is the main thing we do. We take out decay, clean up a tooth, put in a restoration. We treat children, pediatric dentistry. We do periodontal procedures, whether it's scaling and root planing or actual periodontal surgery, root canal work, endodontics. We extract teeth, unfortunately, when needed. And in today's world, we can put them back in, implant dentistry. None of the things I just showed you are possible without good pain control. They are possible, but it would hurt. It would be excruciating and patients understand that and dentists understand that nobody wants to hurt their patient. So the question then is, how do we prevent pain during our dental treatment? And there are two ways to do it. Uh, in, in actual fact, there's really only one, but we have local anesthesia and we have general anesthesia. And being an anesthesiologist, of course, I use both, but local anesthesia has been the backbone of pain control techniques in our profession. Uh, local anesthetics, articane, lidocaine, mepivacaine, and prilocaine. I've left out bupivacaine, uh, which is a long-acting drug, but these are the four drugs you see on the top here that are the most commonly used. Local anesthetics are the safest and the most effective drugs we have in medicine for preventing and managing pain. And as I just mentioned, these are the five drugs that are available throughout the world in our dental profession. Articane, bupivacaine, lidocaine, mepivacaine, and prilocaine. One thing you have to note, I, I wanna let you for sure, you have to know that even though we have these five drugs and I'll be talking about some of these medications, not every country has the availability of all of these drugs. The availability will vary from country to country. The same is true for sedation techniques. I will be briefly discussing this a little bit later on, but again, the availability of oral sedation, intravenous sedation, or inhalation sedation with nitrous oxide will vary depending upon where you're located. So please keep that in mind. These are local anesthetics, absolutely the most important drugs we have in our profession. 
And just to give you an idea as to how many or how much local anesthetic we use, and we are the primary users of the dental profession, much more so than the medical profession. But it is estimated, uh, I, I, I went to the five major manufacturers of local anesthetics worldwide, and I got information how many cartridges they sell every year. Take a look at that number, 1 billion, 1 billion lidocaine cartridges a year. Articaine, 600 million, Vipivacaine, 300 million, and smaller amounts of Prilocaine and Bupivacaine. But when you add this up, this adds up to almost 2 billion dental cartridges that we are using in our profession every year. And then you have to keep in mind that there are countries, and I know we have a lot of my, my friends here from India, where in some situations, uh, local anesthetics are not used in cartridges, they're used in a multi-dose vial. So then it's a staggering amount of local anesthetic that is being used, and which to me basically is telling us how safe these drugs are. So in this animation, we have a patient who has a toothache on a maxillary molar, the, every time that nerve impulse reaches the patient's brain, they feel pain. But what we just did on the lower right-hand side of the screen is we deposited local anesthetic at or above the apex of that tooth. And as the anesthetic drug diffuses into that nerve, the impulses get weaker and weaker. And eventually, if you see here right now, when the, when the nerve is thoroughly saturated, we are blocking the nerve impulses and there is no pain. Local anesthetics are the most commonly used drugs that actually prevent the pain impulse from reaching the patient's brain. Problem, we have to inject them. Okay? And that is a problem because, well, patients don't like it. I mean, if you were to show a, a patient the, the three basic items of the dental armamentarium for local, what do we have? We have a cartridge, we have the syringe, and we have the needle. And uh, money, I would bet on this every time, that of the three items, it's the needle, the needle that is most scary for that patient. So the act of receiving local anesthetic is perceived by the patient and unfortunately by too many dentists as the most traumatic part of the dental procedure. Dentists, patients don't like getting injections, the fear of being hurt, and dentists don't like giving the injection because they don't want to hurt the patient. So fear of the injection is a big problem that we have. So let me introduce right now Jennifer D. St. George. Jennifer D. St. George is actually from the United Kingdom, but she's been living in the United States in Hawaii, lucky her, for many, many years. And she is a practice management consultant. She gives you know presentations on how to make your, your dental practice more productive. Published an article back in 2004, and that's the title, How a Dentist is Judged by Their Patients. And you can see on this slide, uh, number 10 back in 2004 was a high standard of sterilization. I have a feeling, especially in today's world, that if this survey were repeated, this high standard of sterilization would be number one or two or number three. That's how important this is going to become in the future. But these are the reasons, this is the reason I'm actually showing you the survey, because the number one and number two most important things that a patient is looking for when seeking a dentist is a dentist who doesn't hurt and the ability of that doctor to administer a painless injection. Both of these deal with pain. All right, so the question is, and can we make a local anesthetic injection painless? And the answer is yes. However, we can't always guarantee it. There's no guarantee that every injection that we give is going to be painless. However, it is possible for us to make our injections more comfortable. So let's, this, uh, what you see here is called a visual analog scale, abbreviated as VAS. And this is uh, one way when research is done on procedures that may or may not be painful, how, in quotes, the researchers or the scientists will evaluate pain. And the pain, of course, is very subjective. However, on a scale of from zero to 10, if you felt absolutely no pain, it's a zero. If it was the worst pain imaginable, it was a 10. And the way these uh, this scale is read, anything 
from three or lower is comfortable. And as you go to the right-hand side of the scale, it becomes more and more uncomfortable. But for purposes of comfort, on a VAS scale, three, two, one, and zero are considered to be comfortable. Okay, so let's just talk about some generalizations before I get into specifics. How do we make all injections more comfortable? Number one, we use topical anesthetic. Topicals work if you use them properly. And before you ask, you know, uh, what is the best topical? It doesn't matter. Most topicals are benzocaine, some of them are lidocaine, but if you put a little bit of topical, just a little bit, take a cotton applicator stick, put a little bit of topical on it and leave it in the soft tissue at the site of needle penetration. After you take a two by two gauze and you wipe it off and you just sort of clean the area, put the cotton swab with topical on there and leave it for minimally one minute, preferably two. You are now able to penetrate the mucous membrane, the surface mucous membrane for about a millimeter or two. You can get the needle in comfortably. When you put the needle in, we stretch the tissue. This way your nice sharp dental needle will cut, surgically cut the tissue as opposed to tearing the tissue, which is more uncomfortable. As you advance your needle from the penetration point down to the target nerve, wherever that nerve may be, whether you inject local anesthetic ahead of your needle or not is not really relevant. Some people do and some people don't. But you advance the needle slowly. Then when you get down to the place where you want to deposit the volume of drug, you aspirate. We want to, we want to prevent an intravascular injection, but it's important for you to aspirate twice. And between each aspiration, you rotate your hand about 45 degrees to change the bevel orientation. So after two negative aspirations, slowly, and this is really an important one because slow injections are much more comfortable, you slowly deposit the anesthetic drug. Now, the ideal rate for any, any intravenous drug, and this, what we're dealing here again is what if by accident, we did inject the local anesthetic intravenously. If you were to inject it at a rate of one milliliter per minute, one milliliter in 60 seconds, obviously you're not gonna get pain control because you're giving drug intravenously, but you're not gonna have a serious adverse event occur. But for many dentists, one, one ml per minute, which means almost two minutes for a cartridge, they can't do that. It, 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 the average dentist in the United States in a survey I did easily 20, 20 or more years ago, will deposit a cartridge, 1.8 milliliters of solution in about 15 seconds. All right, so we're talking about that's fast. And if you were to deposit the anesthetic accidentally intravenously in that, in that rate, a serious adverse event, an overdose of local anesthetic would occur. So given the fact that most dentists can't, they can't physically bring themselves to inject that slowly, the recommended rate would be one milliliter solution over 30 seconds, which is much more doable. And in this case, both of these would be painless. Slow injection is the important thing. Okay, with that introduction, uh, what I want to do in this program uh, is, is a couple of things. Number one, we're going to talk primarily about how to make local anesthetics more effective and more comfortable, and I'll be discussing the three items in the slide. And then we'll finish up with a discussion of how to improve our success rate in anesthesia on mandibular molars in general, but more specifically on mandibular molars that are infected, pulpally involved mandibular molars. So let's start out then with the computer controlled local anesthetic delivery. And the acronym for this is CCLAD, C-C-L-A-D. So as I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, or maybe a minute ago, slow injections are much more comfortable than fast injections. Fast injections tear tissue, 
when you inject the drug slowly, it diffuses along tissue planes. However, there are two areas, and primarily the palate, where the tissue is so dense that you have to really exert a lot of pressure to get that drug in. And the same is true to a smaller degree with the periodontal ligament injection, the PDL injection, which some people may call the ILI or the intraligamentary injection. But if you were to measure the pressure of the anesthetic drug at the needle tip during a palatal injection, it's very, very high. And that pressure is what produces a lot of the, the pain that occurs during these injections. So back in 1998, and this was the very first of these computerized devices, um, the wand, and that's the brand name, that was the brand name at that time, the wand was introduced in 1998. A friend of mine, Dr. Mark Hockman, who did most of the research on this, uh, did, a, did a study back in 1997. It was published in the New York State Dental Journal where 50 dentists administered palatal injections to each other. They got two injections, one with the computerized device, the wand, and the other with a traditional dental syringe. Using the visual analog scale, as you see here, Okay, they evaluated what they felt. And you can see the green bars are the wand, the computerized device. The yellow bars are the same doctors getting a palatal injection with a traditional syringe. Quite honestly, you can see here that the lower numbers are with the computerized device. And this is the first study, 1997. There have been many studies published. I'm, I'm thinking uh, in the literature going back to that time, almost 20, more, more than 20 years, probably about 20 to 30 papers evaluating these devices and all of them, maybe with one exception, but all of them demonstrating more comfortable injections using a computerized device. So this is the latest version of the wand. It is called the STA wand, and STA stands for single tooth anesthesia. The wand is a device that will, you can see it right here, it sits on a tabletop, an instrument, uh, tabletop, and it's controlled by the foot pedal on the right-hand side of the screen, the black thing. You control the flow of anesthetic with a foot pedal. The syringe, if you want to call it the syringe, the wand itself, the delivery system, you see it here. It, 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 to me, it looks like a saliva ejector with a needle on it. And if you think about this, you know, it, it's not as frightening to the patient as the traditional metal syringe or plastic syringe that some of you may be using. Now, again, it's a large device. It sits on your instrument table. It's a very popular device, but as time goes on, and this has been now 23 years, uh, all electronics become miniaturized. I mean, think about the first cell phones back in the 1800s, you know, it's such a long time ago. They looked like a brick. They were large. And now our cell phones are, they're tiny and they do so much more. So the, the latest version of this is a device called the Dentapen. And uh, this is a picture of one of my, my, one of my dental colleagues who uh, was evaluating it. And he's giving here an infiltration in the, in the uh, maxillary anterior region. Simple device, simple to hold. I'm gonna show you a little uh, animation of how this device is used.
Okay, so that's the new device. And, and I just want to mention this, that um, I was involved in a research study that is going to be published uh, later this year in Quintessence International, where we compared the SDA wand to the Dentapen. And the conclusion very simply was that both of these devices enable the doctor to administer a more comfortable palatal injection. Uh, Again, on a BAS scale, we're talking numbers in the range of one or two or three. I didn't say zero, one or two or three, more comfortable. But there was no difference clinically between these two devices. So whether you want to go with the SDA wand or the Dentapen, irrelevant in, in my way of thinking. Um, and, and again, computerized devices do enable you to give any injection. You don't only use them for pallets and PDL. But you can use these devices for any injection, and it will make your injections more comfortable. So that's our discussion of CLAD, computer-controlled local anesthetic delivery. So let's then move on to the local anesthetic on switch. Now, if you heard me in my prior uh, uh, presentation for something on the last webinar, I did discuss buffering with you a little bit, and I want to go into a little bit more detail with you. Local anesthetics, any local anesthetic, which contains a vasoconstrictor, and epinephrine, of course, is the one that, adrenaline brand name, uh, is the one that is used throughout the world. There are others also. But when a local anesthetic cartridge contains a vasoconstrictor, epinephrine, the, the, the solution is highly acidic. Now, how acidic is it? Well, what we have right here is a graph taking a cartridge of local anesthetic, which contains epinephrine on the lower right, on the lower, I'm sorry, on the right, let's start again, on the left-hand side of the screen, and you see the dotted red line, okay? That is the pH of the cartridge solution. When it's manufactured, it has a pH of around five. Let's make believe this is lidocaine with epinephrine. pH of around five. But as time goes on, and by the time the cartridge comes to you, it's manufactured, it's kept in storage for stability and sterility testing, it is then shipped out to a distributor somewhere. When it, time it comes to you, its pH is usually well below four. And as time goes on at about 12 months, it's about 3.5, 18 months, a year and a half, it's close to three, very acidic. In fact, that's the reason I'm showing you on the right-hand side of the screen, the lemons. Lemon juice, has a pH of around 3.3. And I don't think you would want to do this, but if you if you cut your finger and if you poured lemon juice on it, now why would you do that? Because it would burn. Well, local anesthetics, which contain epinephrine, when you put those first couple of drops in, if you're watching your patient's face as you do it, I, yeah, of course you're watching where you're putting the needle. But as I start depositing the drug, if you just look at the patient's eyes, they usually furrow their brow. Okay, they squint because they feel this burning sensation. It's, it, it's painful. So can we make local anesthetic injections more comfortable? And the answer is yes, we can. I call this the local anesthetic on switch. Again, I use the term, we're gonna buffer the anesthetic uh, cartridge. What we're actually doing is we're changing the pH. We're gonna alkalinize the local anesthetic. And what we're gonna be doing is using something called sodium bicarbonate that is the buffering agent. And by, well, you'll see in a moment, but by adding a little bit of sodium bicarbonate to our dental cartridge, we're gonna raise the pH of the solution from 3.5 to the body's pH of just about 7.4. Okay, what are the benefits? Well, buffering does four very, very nice things. Number one, it provides a faster onset of anesthesia, more profound anesthesia, more comfortable injection, and less post-injection soreness. So let's then look first at the faster onset of anesthesia. Uh, this is a study that I did back in 2011, 2012, was published in 2013. And these are patients who received two injections, one with traditional 
lidocaine with epinephrine, a pH of around 3.5. And then they got an injection of the same cartridge buffered to a pH of 7.4. This was a randomized controlled blinded clinical study. So neither the patient nor the doctor giving the injection, nor I, I was the observer, we knew, did not know what the patient got. Well, it turns out that pulpal anesthesia, inferior alveolar nerve block, mandibular nerve block, testing with a pulp tester, 71% of the patients who received the buffered lidocaine with epinephrine had pulpal anesthesia within two minutes versus only 12% of those same patients when they got the lidocaine with epinephrine that was not buffered. So a much more rapid onset of anesthesia. More profound anesthesia, we'll come back to this in a little bit later in the presentation, but this is a paper that was published. It was actually the, the cover article uh, in the Journal of the American Dental Association back in March of 2019. And essentially the, the, the article is, do buffered local anesthetics provide more successful anesthesia than non-buffered solutions in patients with pulpally involved teeth requiring dental therapy? And the, the short answer right now is yes, but I'll go into this a little bit later on. Third, more comfortable injection. And this is that same survey I talked about earlier, the one I was involved with in the early 2010s. And we asked the patients which injection was more comfortable. And 72% of the patients, not knowing what they got at that time, preferred the buffered local anesthetic and 11% preferred the control, the unbuffered local anesthetic. 16% felt no different. Nothing works all the time for everybody, just keep that in mind. On the visual analog scale, zero being I felt nothing, 10 being the worst pain imaginable, 6% of the patients who got the unbuffered lidocaine with epinephrine, 6% said they felt nothing, no pain whatsoever. 44% of the patients who got the buffered lidocaine with epinephrine, zero on the visual analog scale. Buffering has been done in the medical profession for a very, very long time. And one of the primary reasons, most physicians don't use local anesthetics. However, dermatologists, plastic surgeons, uh, there are some other groups also, but mainly it's plastic surgeons and, and, and dermatologists. Injecting a local anesthetic drug into skin is very, very uncomfortable. I would, I would equate it, because I've unfortunately had to go through this a couple of times, to a painful palatal injection. So what they do, and they don't use cartridges. I mean, physicians don't use dental cartridges. We're fortunate to use cartridges, but they don't. They're using a multi-dose vial, as you can see here in the center. Primarily, they use lidocaine. Lidocaine 1%, lidocaine 2% with epinephrine. And on the left-hand side of the screen, they have sodium bicarbonate. And they mix it together in a plastic disposable syringe. And some of the studies that we looked at, they were using 30, uh, 30 parts lidocaine to one part of uh, bicarbonate, 10 to one, five to one. But the results that they got were good and not so good. It, it really depended upon uh, what the concentration was. But no serious adverse events occur. And that's something very, very important to understand that buffering is not going to change safety. It's not going to change the duration of action of the drug. It's going to simply make the injection more comfortable if done properly. So this is how it's done in medicine. In dentistry, there are two products on the market today. On the right-hand side of the screen, a product called the Anutra Local Anesthetic Delivery System, which essentially is the do-it-yourself product. You have, as you see here in the picture, uh, a multi-dose vial of sodium bicarbonate. You have a multi-dose vial of local anesthetic. And you have a plastic syringe on the right-hand side of the screen that was designed for use with this system. On the left-hand side, you have the original buffering system in the United States, and that is from Onpharma. It is called Onset. Well, 
I know there are a lot of you out there who are not in the United States. And unfortunately, buffering systems today are only available in the United States. Now, if you're in your 20s or 30s and you're going to practice for another 20 years, the likelihood is that buffering systems are going to become available worldwide. But as I just, as the slide says, at this point in time, only in the United States are those buffering systems available. However, if you want to buffer, you still can. And you're going to do it the way the medical doctors do, except that we use cartridges. So what you're going to do is you're going to buy a bottle of sodium bicarbonate. You can go to a pharmacy, a chemist, whatever, buy that bottle. And you take what is called a tuberculin syringe, which is a one milliliter, one cc plastic syringe with very, very fine gradations. You put zero point, the first thing you want to do is take out with that plastic disposable syringe. You want to take out 0.2 milliliters of local anesthetic. Then you add the same amount of sodium bicarbonate to your cartridge. And now your cartridge pH has gone from 3.5 to 7.4. And you give the injection. So it can be done. Again, I don't have the time to go into a lot more detail than this, but absent a buffering system, you can DIY, do it yourself. This is a paper that was just published. I was one of the authors on this, uh, one of the two authors on this. Uh, it, it's The title is Buffering, the Key to More Effective and Comfortable Local Anesthesia. And um, I will offer you a little bit later on in the program uh, the, the ability to email me and to I will send you a copy of this paper. But buffering is something that I really and truly believe is going to become very, very big in local anesthesia throughout the dental profession. And that's the on switch. So then let's talk then about articaine. All right, articaine is a local anesthetic drug. And articaine is the newest of our drugs. It was synthesized in Germany back in 1969. As you can see on the uh, left-hand side of the slide, the original brand name of this drug was Ultracane. And it was a 4% local anesthetic with epinephrine either in a 1 in 100,000 or a 1 in 200,000 concentration. Articane is still the only local anesthetic that was designed for use in dentistry. All the other drugs that we have originally were used in medicine. They came in a multi-dose vial as the physicians I mentioned earlier use it. This drug is our drug. Articaine is available, as I just mentioned, the two most popular concentrations are 4% with epinephrine, one in 100,000, one in 200,000. But in some countries, and this is not in the United States or Canada, but in some countries, articaine is available with epinephrine, one in 400,000. It's available as 4% plain. It's available as a 2% solution with epinephrine. Again, not everywhere, but the two primary and are the articaine with one in 100 and one in 200,000 epinephrine. So articaine is classified as an amide local anesthetic. Okay, so if we look at lidocaine, lidocaine, mepivacaine, prilocaine, bupivacaine, are classified as amides. And you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, the chemical formula for lidocaine, I've circled the, the what is called the amide linkage. This is the chemical bond that all of the amide local anesthetics have in common. On the left-hand side of the screen, we have procaine. Procaine is one of the so-called ester type anesthetics. The original drugs that were used from, well, cocaine was 1886 until about 1948 when the first lidocaine was introduced. But in blue, that is the ester linkage. That is what every ester type anesthetic has in common. Take a look at articaine. Articaine, even though it's classified as an amide local anesthetic, is actually a hybrid. It has both an amide and an ester linkage. Now that confers some very interesting properties to articaine. Safety, in fact, this is an article by Wolfgang Jakob from Germany where he evaluated the blood level, the plasma level of lidocaine and articaine. As the drug leaves the nerve, enters into the cardiovascular system, 
the drug needs to be metabolized, to be detoxified. And for amide local anesthetics, lidocaine on this slide, metabolism occurs in the liver. It has to diffuse to the liver. Articaine, like other ester type local anesthetics, is metabolized in the blood plasma. And if you can see here that the blood level of articaine decreases significantly more rapidly than does lidocaine. Now, why is that important? It's important for this, and by the way, let me go back to this slide. This has nothing to do with duration of action of the drug. The fact that a drug is metabolized more rapidly has no relevance to its duration of action. As long as the anesthetic drug stays in the nerve, it's blocking nerve conduction. This process you see in the slide starts only when the drug leaves the nerve and enters into the blood and reaches the liver for lidocaine. So I made this comment earlier that local anesthetics are the safest and the most effective drugs in medicine for the prevention and management of pain. Articaine, yeah, in the United States, we got the drug in the year 2000. In fact, next month, June, will be the 20th anniversary of Articaine's introduction into dentistry in the US. In the United States, in 2018, I'll show you more recent numbers in a moment, but at the end of 2018, Articaine was now the number two most used local anesthetic. Worldwide in dentistry, Articaine is the second most used local anesthetic. It is the newest drug, yet it is second most used, only to lidocaine. Okay, it's a very popular molecule. These are some numbers uh, I, I got from various countries as to what the market share of Articaine is. Now, keep in mind that Articaine was synthesized in Germany, was 1976, the first country to get the drug. 98% of local anesthetic usage by German dentists is Articaine. Poland, 90%, France, 70%, in Spain, 68%, in Italy, 50, a little over 50%. In the United States, the third quarter of the year 2019, Articaine was now 41%. So what we're actually seeing, and let's go back to the United States. Articaine was introduced in the year 2000. So let's go back to, if you go back to 1999, lidocaine was about 75% of the dental market in the United States. It's now about 47%. So what we're seeing is the sales of Articaine going up, and the sales of lidocaine going down. And I, I'm willing to make a bet that within the next five or so years, that articaine will become in the United States and in most other countries, the most popular local anesthetic molecule. Why? Okay. I mean, all locals are good. They work most of the time and um, they're all safe when used properly. So how is articaine better? Is it better? And there is, you know, well, when I give a full day presentation, local anesthetic, um, I, I spend a lot of time discussing this because all locals are good. And in the clinical studies I'll mention a little bit later, articaine was shown to be just as effective as lidocaine. It wasn't shown to be better. And what we did in our studies, we did traditional injections. We gave mandibular, I'm gonna use this term mandibular block as a generic term. We call it the inferior alveolar nerve block. Some of you may call it the IDB, the, the inferior dental block. We did those injections. We did maxillary infiltration, and we found no clinical difference in efficacy between lidocaine and articaine. But then, once articaine became marketed in the US, people began endodontists primarily doing research. This is the mandible, and in the adult mandible, the cortical plate of bone is thick, it's dense. Unlike the maxilla where infiltration works because the bone up there is porous. Infiltration as a rule doesn't work in the mandible. Uh, it would be nice if it did, but we're, we're stuck, aren't we stuck with that darned inferior alveolar nerve block, that mandibular block. So let's talk about a couple of studies that were done. Again, I'm gonna go through these studies kind of rapidly with you, but they started taking articaine and giving a buccal infiltration in the mandible. 
And I'm gonna talk about mandibular molars essentially right now. So let's take a look at a study where they gave an articane buccal infiltration in an attempt to get pulpal anesthesia on mandibular posterior teeth. And in this study, they deposited a full cartridge in the United States, it's 1.8 mLs, in the buccal fold by the mandibular first molar. And they pulp tested every three minutes over an hour. And success was based upon two consecutive pulp tests with no response to maximum output from that pulp tester. Take a look at the numbers here. Okay, on the on the lidocaine was 45%, starting on the second molar going anterior. Lidocaine was 45%, 57%, 67%, and 61%. But look at articaine, 75, 87, 92, and 86%. Okay, and all of these values were statistically significant. So it does diffuse better. And there's a reason for it, because articaine is more lipid soluble than all other dental local anesthetics. This is the chemical formulation of the formula for, for, for articaine. And what I have highlighted in the yellow is what is called a thiophene ring. All local anesthetics to be lipid soluble have to have what's called an organic ring. And most local anesthetics other than articaine have a benzene ring. Articaine doesn't. It has a thiophene ring. And, a, and thiophene is more lipid soluble than benzene. Simple. Articaine diffuses through soft and hard tissue into nerves more effectively than the other local anesthetics. All right, so that study was using articaine simply as an infiltration, nothing else being done. But let's take a look at this study. Again, this is one of many studies, but I wanted to talk about a study where they gave an inferior alveolar nerve block lidocaine with epinephrine. It was done in the UK, so the epinephrine was 1 in 80,000 concentration. They gave a lidocaine in free alveolar nerve block, and they then supplemented it with an articaine buccal infiltration by the mandibular first molar. So on, the, on this slide, this is just a graph showing you the results of the study published back in 2009. The line on the bottom, the blue line, was the patient who got the lidocaine block only, 55.6% success. Now, the patients, it was double-blinded study. Patients came in twice, okay? And they got either the, 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 the block with no supplemental injection or the block with the articaine supplement. And on those patients, when they got the articaine supplement, the 55% success became 91%. That's the line on top of the slide. Now, if you go to the right-hand side of the slide, the study was stopped at 45 minutes. But if you notice that line, the lidocaine, the, the, the uh, pink line, the red line, which is the articaine supplementation, at the end of the study in 45 minutes, there's still no indication of the anesthesia going away. But the study stopped at that time. In other words, you could keep on working and still have an, uh, over a 90% success for pulpal anesthesia. So articaine, again, it's a, it's a wonderful molecule. It's a new drug. It's, it, it will become, if it's not in your country right now, it will become probably, in my estimation, the number one used local anesthetic in our profession. Then let's talk a little bit about mandibular molars. Those three, six teeth, if you will, but the three teeth here, um, they're a problem. Uh, are they a problem? Well, this is a paper that was published back in 2006. And I, I like it because it was a simple survey of general dentists okay, in a conservative dental therapy clinic. And this is the question, the way it was phrased in the study. How often do you encounter inefficiency of local anesthesia, both by infiltration and conduction during manipulation of various tooth groups? Inefficiency means it hurt, <laughs> it didn't work. And conduction anesthesia is what we also call nerve block anesthesia. Well, on the left-hand side of this slide, there are 121 dentists in the survey. The gray area are the maxillary teeth, incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. The brownish color on the bottom are mandibular teeth. And they asked the doctors, did you have a problem often, sometimes, rarely, 
very rarely and never. Well, my two categories that I'm concerned with are often or sometimes. And take a look at this. Look at the mandibular molars. This is, again, conservative dental treatment. No pulpally, invo no pulpal involvement here, no infection. 55% of these dentists, often or sometimes, admitted to having a problem achieving profound anesthesia on mandibular molars. Now, I'm looking over here on the lower right-hand side of the slide, that one person who made the comment that I never have a problem. Um, every time I give a lecture on local anesthesia, I ask if this doctor is present in the room, he or she is never there. Uh, I'm thinking perhaps that they are an orthodontist. They haven't given an injection ever, okay? But again, 55% of these doctors do admit to having a problem often or sometimes on non pulpally involved mandibular molars. But then let's add infection to this. Okay, let's add infection. Now, in that same survey, when I asked the doctors, given certain types of dental pathology, how often do you have a problem? And if you look at the categories going across the very top, almost always, often, sometimes, rarely and never. So let's take a look at those first three columns. I almost always have a problem, I often have a problem, and I sometimes have a problem. Exacerbated chronic pulpitis, 69% of the doctors. Acute pulpitis, which is called symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, 74% of these doctors almost always, often, and sometimes have a problem achieving pain control. So we call this the hot mandibular molar, probably the most difficult situation for any dentist when it comes to achieving profound pain control. And there are reasons for it. We have the effect of inflammation on local anesthetics. We have the effect of infection, which lowers the pH. The tissue is now no longer 7.4 pH, it's a much lower pH, which means the anesthetic drug will not be as effective. Here's a patient, today is the 26th of, of May, uh, who start, when they come into your office and you ask them, when did you feel, when did it start hurting? And they mentioned January. Okay, they've been in pain now for three, four months. Well, why are you here this morning at 7 a.m., which is when they usually show up? Because doctor, in the last three days, I haven't been able to sleep. The pain's become excruciating. And if you look at the bottom, Fear of dentistry. And that's the reason this patient is in trouble in the first place. If they had come to see us in January when they had a little twinge on that tooth, would have given a local, would have cleaned out the tooth, put a restoration in, and the problem's over. There is no problem. But when you take each of these items and add them up, including that fear of dentistry, this becomes the biggest challenge we have in our profession. So let's then, let me, I, I'm going to have to do this quickly, but Talk about how can we improve our success rate? We're, nev we're never gonna get to 100% success. Keep that in mind. But the first thing you wanna do is break that pain cycle and treat the infection. Take away the infection, break the pain cycle, and we have a better chance of achieving profound anesthesia. So antibiotics, if indicated for infection, analgesics, the NSAIDs, ibuprofen or paracetamol, which is in the United States, it's called acetaminophen. These are the best drugs we have, but break that cycle. Then select your favorite technique. Okay, uh, again, even though I have the incisive nerve block here for the premolars, canine incisors, I'm dwelling on mandibular molars. So we have a bunch of options here. And we'll come back to these, but most of you are gonna continue to use a traditional inferior alveolar nerve block. That is the most common technique. Sorry, I made a mistake. Okay, so number one is technique. Number two is Articane. As I mentioned earlier, Articane is a better drug. And I would, pref I would recommend that you use Articane by inferior alveolar nerve block. But what I want you to notice here, though, it says two cartridges. Okay, in other words, when you give your block, whether it's Gal Gates or inferior alveolar nerve block, Articane, it says in parentheses buffered. I like buffering. 
Articane, give one, go back and give a second one. This is again on the mandibular molar that is infected. In, in a non-infected tooth, one cartridge is more than enough, but when the tooth is infected, I would recommend going with two cartridges at the onset, okay? Whatever technique you're gonna use. But this next slide is really important. Regardless of what drug you're using for the block, I mentioned articane, you can use lidocaine, mepivacaine, prilocaine, but when you finish the block, the two cartridges, take articane, infiltrate about a half a cartridge in the buccal fold at the apex of the tooth being treated. And I showed you this earlier. This is that study where a 55% success rate became 91%. Now, keep in mind that this study here was not done on infected teeth. So the numbers that you're going to see are not going to be as good as this. But whatever your number is for your lidocaine, mepivacaine, prilocaine, articaine, IDB, mandibular block all by itself, the blue line, okay, the articaine buccal infiltration is going to increase your success rate. It may not get to 91.7%, but it will be better than the 55.6 that we see on this slide. So number three is buffering. Okay, now this is the paper I showed you earlier, but what I want to show you is the conclusion in the study. Again, the paper, let me read it again. Do buffered local anesthetics provide more successful anesthesia than non-buffered solutions in patients with pulpally involved teeth requiring dental treatment? And the conclusion, this investigation revealed that buffered local anesthetics are more effective than unbuffered local anesthetics when used for mandibular or maxillary anesthesia in pulpally involved teeth. Buffered local anesthetics have a 2.29 greater likelihood of achieving successful anesthesia. Some other options, the periodontal ligament injection, again, also called by some of you the intraligamentary injection, the ILI. And it, it, it means depositing two tenths of one ml now, regardless of the size of the cartridge you have, whether it's 1.7, 1.8, or 2.2 mLs, that little silicon stopper, the bung that some of you may call, that is the equivalent of about 0 0.2 milliliters of solution. And you have to deposit it. You take the needle, bevel against the root, you slide it down as far as it'll go. You wanna get it wedged in between the root and the interproximal bone and you deposit two tenths of one ml. As you can see here in the slide, the anesthetic will diffuse into the interproximal bone and diffuse down to the apex of the tooth. You need to do this on both of the roots of that mandibular molar. Onset of anesthesia is essentially immediate. Uh, duration is, I don't know, because you're only putting in a small volume, but it will get you going. And if you have to go back and repeat the injection, then go ahead and do it. But PDL injections work. The other option for this is intraosseous anesthesia. Now, again, not in the United States, within the endodontic community, it's a very popular injection because it works. And what you're going to be doing, and this is a painless injection, is depositing, you have to drill a hole with a, with a, a small round burr in the interproximal bone distal to the tooth you're treating. So if we're treating this mandibular first molar, we're going to drill that hole distal to it between the first and second molars. The only anesthesia you need to make this painless is infiltration of that soft tissue. Once you drill the hole, you put the needle in, you deposit about a half to two thirds of a cartridge very, very slowly. And that is very, very important, very, very slowly. And you can see here that if you start treating that mandibular first molar and you start stimulating that nerve, well, the nerve impulse cannot get to the patient's brain because the anesthetic drug is blocking it. Very effective in the endodontic situation. And then sedation. Um, of all the sedation techniques, again, if you heard me on my first webinar, uh, nitrous oxide is the one. And, and, and especially in a situation like this, because keep in mind that we have a patient who's in this endodontic problem because of their fear of dentistry. Nitrous oxide relaxes the patient. 
But in addition, it also raises the pain threshold. So if your block failed, it's not gonna be of any help. But if your block is almost good, but they're feeling perhaps a twinge, it'll raise the pain threshold enough that the patient will no longer be bothered by that twinge. So let me just go over this. This is my algorithm, if you will. We're gonna start out with either a gout gates or an inferior alveolar nerve block using two cartridges, preferably buffered local anesthetic of either lidocaine, mepivacaine, or articaine, following it immediately with a buccal infiltration at the apex of the first or second molar, whichever one you're doing, with a half a cartridge of buffered articaine. I understand that we don't always have buffering, but again, with articaine. If you need help following this, we will then do the periodontal ligament injection, an option or instead of, instead of, or in addition to would be intraosseous anesthesia. And in virtually all situations, but not all entirely, that will allow you to enter the pulp chamber of that mandibular molar comfortably. If it doesn't, we have intrapulpal. We don't want to do intrapulpal anesthesia because it can be very uncomfortable, but that's the last option and it does work. So recommendations for greatest success, articaine, buffered local anesthetic, select your most preferred technique and use sedation if you have it available. Keeping in mind that not everybody out here has buffering available. so. Logically, number one is articaine. Number two is select your most preferred technique, the one that works best in your hands. And number three, please keep in mind that these patients are dental phobics. That's why they're in this situation in the first place. And of all the sedation techniques, there are inhalation sedation with nitrous oxide oxygen. If it's available to you, use it on this patient. So let me just finish up with these, with, the, with this, you know, begging you, if you will. Please start using articaine by buccal infiltration. You're going to see, you know, give your block, use your articaine. You're going to see a dramatic increase in your success rates. And when it becomes, if it is available, United States, or when it becomes available overseas or DIY, do it yourself. I strongly recommend buffering all mandibular injections. This is my email address, malamid at usc.edu. And if you, uh, if you want to email me after the first webinar, I had hundreds of, of people uh, asking for articles and also asking some very, very good questions. So feel free. Uh, to email me since we're still in lockdown here in California. I have all the time in the world uh, to, to respond to emails. Okay. And um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for joining me in this webinar. And I'm hoping that some of the material we discussed here today will be a benefit to you in your clinical practice. So we're now going to open this up to a, a Q&A period. And I want to thank you once again. Yes, thank you all. Of course, thank you, uh, thank you, Stanley. So we we do have a lot of questions. Uh, maybe the the very first one. Uh, you said in your introduction that uh, well, pain was one of the main things um, patients judge their dentist on. Uh, you also said that safety would probably become uh, more and more important for dentists, but also in in the patient view. Um, how uh, how do how do you think safety will uh, will become and uh, maybe I don't know safety needles uh, sterile single use uh, elements uh, how do you think your dentistry will evolve in this context? Well, first of all, here in the United States, dentistry is still closed down uh, except for emergency procedures. And the biggest problem we have in our profession, which is a big problem, is spray. You know, I'm not worried about the safety. I mean, yes, it's important safety needles and things like that, but 
it's that spray that comes out of the patient's mouth, whether it's from the high speed handpiece, uh, anything that we're doing in a patient's mouth. And, and how do we prevent that? That's the reason why dental offices have been closed down. We can't protect ourselves from that spray. And that is going to change the way our dental profession works. Again, I don't have an answer to that one. I really don't. But we have to address that because this virus and new viruses, which will occur, obviously, in the future, are out there. I mean, I go back to the days in dentistry before wearing masks, gloves, and glasses. And when I started wearing glasses, wow, there was an awful lot of stuff <laughs> that was on the glasses when you're drilling in a patient's mouth. It was there when I wasn't wearing glasses, but I didn't know it and it got into my eyes and I probably inhaled it. So again, I don't have really a good answer for that, except for the fact that our profession is going to change because we're gonna to have to change because of what's going on out there right now. Right, thank you. We, we have a lot of questions also um, about children. Uh, could, could you please give us some tips regarding dental injection for children? Sure. Uh, whomever asked that question was not with us at the last uh, uh, mm -hmm. webinar. But, okay, children, one of the, the, the biggest problem that we might have with children when it comes to local anesthesia, it's a problem that occurs when a non-pediatric dentist, in other words, when a general dentist is treating children. So. This is a question that I anticipated getting. And, you know, Articane is a fantastic drug. And, and uh, one of the questions that probably if will come up if it hasn't already is how come it says that you shouldn't use Articane in patients who are under four years of age? Well, first of all, Articane is a very, very safe drug in any age group. But let's talk specifically, if you will, about the younger patient. And here's the reason, this is the package insert from, from septicane. This is a United States product, okay? And it says, the indication, septicane is a combination of articane and amide local anesthetic and epinephrine, a vasoconstrictor, indicated for local infiltrative or conduction anesthesia in both simple and complex dental procedures. And here's the important part, in adults and pediatric patients four years of age and older. Okay, so let's talk about the safety of local anesthetics in children, specifically using Articane, uh, as it says here, four years of age and older. In the late 19, the United States got the drug in June, Articane, in June of 2000. So to get a drug approved in the United States by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, you have to demonstrate to them that a drug is both safe and effective. And I was involved in the clinical studies that were done. There were 29 dental schools in the United States and the United Kingdom involved in the studies. And these are the three papers that we had published. One is these were published in the year 2000 and 2001. Two of them in the American Dental Association Journal and the one on the right-hand side of the screen in the Journal of Pediatric Dentistry. Uh, they were uh, the uh, efficacy of Articane, the safety of Articane, and the pediatric use of Articane. So why? Okay, why is it say four years of age and above? Because in our pediatric study, we enrolled patients who were four years of age and above. Okay, and this is what it says. It says that Articane was approved for the age of four years of, and above. And the reason is we proved to the FDA that Articane is safe. We didn't enroll patients who were three, two, and one. We did not do that. So there was no clinical proof that Articane is safe and effective in that age group. So the question is, can Articane be administered to children who are under the age of four? And it says here, yes, absolutely yes. Now, I want you to keep one thing in mind. I'm in the United States, so what I'm dealing with now is, in quotes, legalities in my country. Using Articane on a three-year-old or a two-year-old is called an off-label use of a drug. And uh, this is, uh, again, the United States. To, for a drug, to, I'm going to read most of this to you, but it is important to know that before a drug can be approved, the drug company 
must submit clinical data and other information for the FDA to review. The company must show that the drug is both safe and effective for its intended uses. Safe does not mean that the drug has no side effects. All drugs have side effects. Instead, it means that the FDA has determined that the benefits of using the drug for a particular use outweigh the potential risks. Benefit outweighs the risk. Many people may be surprised to know that the FDA regulates drug approval, not drug prescribing. A doctor is free to prescribe a drug for any reason that they think is medically appropriate. On the bottom, off-label use is so common that virtually every drug is used off-label in some circumstances. Let me go back to that one statement. The FDA regulates drug approval, not drug prescribing. Once a drug is marketed, a doctor, whether it's a medical doctor or a dental doctor in the United States, can use that drug as they see fit. So let's look at an article that goes back now to 1989 in Canada. Canada got the drug in 1986, and it was approved for the age of four years and above. Gerald Wright, Canadian, he's a professor and a pediatric dentist in Canada, did a paper. It was published in 1989 in the journal Anesthesia Progress. A retrospective survey reports the use of articaine hydrochloride as an anesthetic in children under four years of age. The data was collected by a record audit in two pediatric dental offices. Articaine was administered to 211 patients under the age of four, 29 having additional administrations of the drug. So they got not one articaine injection, they got more than one articaine injection. And in some instances, the dosages of articaine given exceeded the recommended concentration for older children. No systemic adverse reactions were noted on the charts or known to the clinicians. This report provides initial evidence of the use of articaine in children under four years of age. So the answer is yes. Yes, articaine is safe. Now, let me, I want to explain why. When it comes to local anesthetics in children, the major adverse event consideration is overdose. The new term for this is local anesthetic systemic toxicity, which is abbreviated as LAST, LASC. And most of these adverse events occur when the local anesthetic is administered properly. In other words, intravenous injection obviously would not be proper, but giving it properly following two negative aspirations, injecting slowly, it's putting in too much. And it occurs most often in a patient who weighs under 30 kilos, which is 66 pounds. Local anesthetic overdose, local anesthetic systemic toxicity. As I showed you earlier, Okay, the amide local anesthetics, the lidocaine, mepivacaine, prilocaine, they block nerve conduction. They stop working when they, are, when they diffuse into the cardiovascular system and are taken away and are metabolized in the patient's liver. Articaine, 95% of its metabolism occurs within minutes of leaving the nerve. It's metabolized by esterases, enzymes that are found in the blood. And the half-life of articaine has been calculated to be between 20 and 27 minutes in adults. In the geriatric population, the half-life is 27 minutes. And in children, the half-life is 18 to 23 minutes. So when it comes to an overdose of local anesthetic based on giving an overly large dose, articaine is a much safer medication. All right, so that's I mean, really that's the main thing. It's it's not giving a lot of local anesthetic to young children. Yet you don't need to give full cartridges. Uh, the the thicker a nerve is, the more anesthetic you need. So with an adult patient, we talk about giving 1.8 mLs of local anesthetic or 2.2 mLs in some countries to get the inferior alveolar nerve block to do a Galgate's mandibular block. 
for a maxillary infiltration for an adult, you put in a third of a cartridge. Okay, when it comes to children, you don't need that much. I, I'm, I, that's just, there's no magic number here, no magic way of doing this. But if you just took your adult dose and cut it in half on a child, okay, you'd have profound anesthesia because number one, their, their bone is thinner, the anesthetic works better, and the nerve is thinner. So it's a lot easier to get the drug in there. So basically it's giving less. It's giving less local anesthetic on young children. And again, Articane is, is my preferred local anesthetic for children, basically because of the fact that uh, it, it's metabolized so much more rapidly than the other local anesthetic drugs. Right, thank you. And uh, we do have um, several uh, questions about the maximum uh, number of cartridges that could be given to children uh, and even to adults. Maybe if you could uh, remind them. Um, sure. Formula. <laughs> to get okay, um, I don't have that slide right available. I apologize for that. I didn't anticipate that question. But in that drug package insert, that piece of paper that comes inside the box of local anesthetic, it gives you the recommended maximum recommended dose, MRD. And for every drug based on kilograms, for example, in the United States, for lidocaine, the maximum dose is based on seven milligrams per kilo, not to exceed 500 milligrams. Articane is seven milligrams per kilo in the United States. Uh, other drugs are 6.6, .6, but read the package insert that comes in that box of local anesthetic, whatever country you're in. Now, that is a maximum recommended dose. We don't want to go there. If, if the maximum dose of articane is 500 milligrams, keeping in mind that there are 72 milligrams inside of a cartridge of articane, okay, it's a 4% solution, 40 milligrams per milliliter, 1.8 mLs in a cartridge, 72 milligrams in a cartridge. Okay, you can, in theory, administer up to 500 milligrams, but why? You want to use the lowest volume, the smallest volume of local anesthetic that you need to achieve profound anesthesia. And you rarely need to give that maximum dose. Now, also keep in mind this, that, that maximum recommended dose is based upon giving it all at one time. And I, I can't imagine why you would do that. But if you were to give a cartridge now work patient begins to feel it a little bit later, half an hour, 40 minutes later, you go back and give another cartridge. Okay, you, you, it, it's safer, it's safer. But the maximum recommended dose is simply there as it, it's an absolute in theory, but it's based upon the administration of that entire volume at one time, which you should not be doing. You wanna use the smallest volume of anesthetic that is effective for getting pain control. Right, and uh, talking about using the, the smallest um, volume possible, um, we have a question asking how to choose between the, the articane one in 100 and the articane one in 200, so when it comes to a vasoconstrictor dosage. Okay, well, when it comes to vasoconstrictor dosage, there's very little difference. The only difference when it comes to using lidocaine with one in 100, one in 1,000 epinephrine is if you're using it for hemostasis. In other words, you're gonna be doing a soft tissue surgical procedure and you want to minimize bleeding. The one in 100,000 epinephrine will be more effective as a vasoconstrictor than the one in 200,000 epinephrine. But you know that's really not much of a consideration because what you're doing for hemostasis is you're not giving a nerve block you're taking that cartridge of local anesthetic with a needle, you're putting that needle tip into that papilla, and you're putting a drop of local anesthetic in, and the tissue turns white, it's ischemic. And now you can do your surgical procedure with less bleeding. But when it comes to effective pain control, the one in 100,000, the one in 200,000 articane solutions are effective, both of them are. And there's little difference whatsoever. In fact, I would say that there's none. They both work. So let's let's look at this logically. Let's let me talk about the United States. Most of the dentists in the U.S., the 40% market share of Articane, are using the one in a hundred thousand concentration 
not the one in 200,000 concentration. Why? Because Articane 1 in 100,000 was, was approved by the FDA in June of the year 2000. 1 in 200,000 epinephrine was approved five years later. Now, given the fact that there's no clinical difference in those two drugs when it comes to pain control, logically, you would be want to, you'd want to use the lesser concentration of epinephrine, especially in a geriatric age group. I'm pointing to myself if you can't see that. Uh, because people at either end of the bell-shaped curve, the under, we basically we always say under the age of six and over the age of 65, there are more patients who are hyper-responders. And a hyper-responder with epinephrine will have tachycardia, will feel palpitations, will get shaky, they start sweating a lot. So less epinephrine is good, okay? But again, most of the doctors are using one in 100,000 because it had a five-year head start. And since there's really no clinical difference in how the drug works, they haven't changed. But again, one in 200,000 articane, when it comes to pain control purposes, is as effective as one in 100,000 articane, and you're giving that patient less epinephrine. The only advantage to one in 100,000 articane is for hemostasis, but you're only putting a drop or two in, and the one in 100,000 is better in that situation. Thank you very much. So we do have maybe 15, 15 questions um, about articane and nerve block, articane and neurotoxicity, and of course, paresthesia, even one of the dentists saw that you do have a slide about that. So could you please come on this slide? Well, that was the other thing I anticipated whenever I discuss Articane. So let's, again, this is the short version. I can't, obviously, with the time factor right now, I can't give you the, the, the long version here. But it all started back in 1995 in Canada. They got the drug in 1986. And Dan Haas published a paper uh, talking about the incidence of local anesthetic paresthesia in the province of Ontario, Canada. And what I'm showing you here on the right hand side of the screen is from his article, the percentage of patients who had lingual nerve paresthesia. Sharon Hillerup in Denmark in 2006 published a paper by the way, all four of these papers uh, are, are doctors who recommended against the use of articane for inferior alveolar nerve block for mandibular block. Hillerup in Denmark, 77% of the patients that he looked at the records had lingual paresthesia. In Australia, 80%, only five patients in this study, 80% of them had lingual anesthesia, paresthesia. And the United States, uh, Garisto and Haas in 2010, 92% of the patients had lingual paresthesia. So let me just go through some quickly with you this information. Half of the injections that we give intraorally are in the mandible, and the other half are in the maxillary arch. Okay. More than 90% of all the reported cases of paresthesia in dentistry, going back to the 1950s, occur in the mandible. Between 70 and 92% of those cases only involve the lingual nerve. Articane, even though it's a dental drug, is now being used in medicine. And as far as I know, and I look at the literature on a regular basis, uh, there are no reported cases of paresthesia following articane administration outside the oral cavity. So, is it possible for a drug to be so specifically neurotoxic that it only damages nerves in the mouth, specifically in the mandible, and more specifically, the lingual nerve? The answer is no. If a drug is a neurotoxin, it damages nerves. It can't distinguish between a maxillary nerve, the sciatic nerve, or a nerve in the mandible. It can't do that. So if the paresthesia, and I get involved because of what I do. I have the textbooks. I'm sort of well-known in this area. 
I get involved in medical legal situations. I do defense. I try to defend. And I get involved, unfortunately, well, going back to the year 2000 with a number of cases where a dentist was sued by a patient when they had paresthesia. Okay, now this is my interpretation. If the paresthesia involves the distribution of the inferior alveolar nerve or the mental nerve, in other words, the chin, the lower lip, the buccal soft tissue have paresthesia. These are the five possibilities. Yes, it could be the drug. It could be the epinephrine. It could be mechanical trauma of the metal needle contacting a nerve. It could be a hematoma, blood irritates the nerve, and it could be edema. Edema compresses the nerve. So these are the five possibilities. If the distribution of the paresthesia involves the inferior alveolar nerve or the mental nerve. However, keep in mind that virtually all of the cases between 70 and 92% of the cases of paresthesia involve only one nerve, the lingual nerve. And it's my, I, I, and I firmly believe this, it's mechanical trauma. And very often this happens when a patient, as you're administering your local anesthetic, as you're advancing your needle through that soft tissue, the patient jumps. And when they jump, we normally stop, we take out the syringe and we ask them what happened. And the patient will then say to us, I felt an electric shock, or they use the word a zap. Okay. Yeah, mechanical, the metal needle contacting that lingual nerve. So, Professor Dr. Stanley Malamuth, if it's only the lingual nerve, it's mechanical, it is not chemical. Uh, another way of looking at this is how much volume, if it is the drug, how much volume of local anesthetic are you depositing? specifically to anesthetize the lingual nerve and how much are you depositing of that cartridge with the inferior alveolar? And the answer is you're putting in the vast bulk. If it's a 1.8 ml cartridge, you're putting in 1.5, 1.6 mLs to get the inferior alveolar nerve. You're putting in a couple of drops, if any, for the lingual nerve. And if it was due to the drug, Okay, you would expect to see that the inferior alveolar nerve distribution, the chin, the lower lip, the buccal soft tissue would be anesthetized, but that's not the case. In clinical practice, it's almost always the lingual nerve. It's mechanical, not chemical. So I wanna finish off by, let's take a look at this literature because this is, uh, again, this whole concept, this whole uh, controversy began in 1995. And even though it, it, it dies down, and in fact, uh, happily, whatever in the United States right now, it is really not a major consideration. It is in other places, obviously, since a good number of you asked that question. You cannot do clinical studies on damaging nerves on human beings. It's, it's unethical. So what is done in research is a precursor nerve cell. It's abbreviated SHSY5Y. This is a precursor nerve cell, and it's been used in research to determine drug toxicity. So I'm gonna just go through a couple of papers quickly with you, give you the results. This paper was published in a medical anesthesiology journal, Anesthesia and Analgesia. One of the, other than anesthesiology, this is the, the second most uh, read, looked at, respected anesthesia journal. And, um, the study was entitled The Comparative Cytotoxic Effects of Different Local Anesthetics on a Human Neuroblastoma Cell Line. And the conclusion was our results suggest that among local anesthetics commonly used in dentistry, articane and ropivacaine, ropivacaine is a drug like bupivacaine, long acting, that really is not used in our profession. So our, our results suggest that among local anesthetics commonly used in dentistry, articane had the least neurotoxic effects in our study of SHSY5Y studies after exposure corresponding to dental practice. In a paper published in the Journal of Dental Research, this is actually an abstract. The full paper was published in the journal Anesthesia, Anesthesia uh, Progress in 2018. The paper was the effects of lidocaine and articaine on neuronal survival and recovery. 
In summary, articane did not produce a prolonged block of neuronal responsiveness or increase in toxicity as compared to lidocaine. The corollary that articane does not produce a prolonged loss of responsiveness or cell death as compared to lidocaine under these conditions is perhaps the most relevant conclusion. And there are other papers I don't have the time to go into right now, but the clinical research does not show that articane is more neurotoxic. There are no, there, there's no scientific evidence. You know, all of the studies, all the papers that have been published are not studies. If you look at them carefully, they are all case reports, individual case reports or composite case reports. And when it comes to scientific validity, the case report is the bottom of the barrel, okay? Uh, randomized controlled clinical studies are much more scientifically valid. There are no scientific studies that show that articane is or does have a higher rate or risk of paresthesia. Thanks. So that, that was very clear, I believe. Um, so we still have five minutes. Maybe let's say two, the, the last two questions. Um, one is about topicals. Do you still use spray anesthesia or maybe more generally topicals before the shots? Well, I mentioned earlier that we use, uh, we use topical. I, I strongly recommend the use of topical, whether it's a spray or a gel, uh, it doesn't really matter. The only problem I have with a spray is you know if you take if you take a gel of topical as I said earlier put a little bit on the end of a, a cotton applicator stick and after drying the the soft tissue in the mouth with a two by two gauze you leave it there for two minutes that's my preferred but the problem I have with some sprays is that you can just press it down and it just keeps on administering the drug and even though uh, with some of the local anesthetics used for topical an overdose is not easy to achieve. If you have a spray, in fact, here, let me do this. I'm gonna pick up, this is a make-believe it's a topical anesthetic. It has to be the air compressor for my computer cleaning. If I do this, I'm putting a lot of drug in and that's the problem. Okay, you wanna limit the amount of local you're putting in, whether it comes to topical or the injectable drug. That's why I prefer the gel. Uh, if you want to ask me which gel I prefer, the answer is I don't care. They work. You know, I, I, I recently had some dental work done and um, I believe in topical. But when people tell me that this topical tastes like cherry or it tastes like chocolate, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, topicals are okay. They work. But the taste is something that is not that great. But if you use topical properly, by putting just a little bit on the tip of that cotton applicator stick, they don't taste it. If you put a lot on, like going into a ice cream store and getting three scoops of ice cream, when you put that lot of topical in the patient's mouth, it'll liquefy. And when you start tasting the topical, it doesn't taste good, but you shouldn't taste the topical if you put, a, if you put just a small amount on. But topicals do work. And whether, again, my problem with the spray is that if that spray that you're using doesn't deliver a metered dose, just a little bit comes out, if you can do what I just showed you, just keep on spraying it, okay, that becomes potentially dangerous. But topicals are excellent, they work. Thanks. And to, to finish with, there were some questions about the, the, the C-clats, so the uh, electronic syringes. Um, so those the the doctors were asking, um, can you use the so the the dentapen? Is it good enough uh, for any type of tooth, uh, especially posterior teeth? We also had the question uh, of could it be used for nerve blocks, and then uh, can the dentapen be used for children? Okay, well first let's take care of the children part. Of course, you can use any syringe on anybody. So there's no there's no limitation on what you can do. Uh, so Dentapen, the wand, or and there are other devices out there in other countries, but these devices can be used for any injection on any patient, any size. You know, if you're going to use the Dentapen or the wand for an inferior alveolar nerve block, 
the, the important point is the needle. Literally, the important point is the needle you're putting on it. You want to use the appropriate length needle. So the answer is, for any computer-controlled anesthetic delivery system, you can use it for any injection in the mouth. Yes, most often they're used for the palate and for the, uh, the, the periodontal ligament injection, but you can use these devices for any injection on an adult or a child. The needle is the important point. It's the length of your needle. One of the things that you were taught early in your dental training is that you don't want to insert a dental needle all the way into the soft tissue to its hub. Okay, you don't want to do that. So you're going to use the appropriate length needle for that injection on that patient. But you can use these devices for any injection on any patient. Right, thank you so much, uh, Professor Malamed. It's uh, half past six now uh, in France time. So um, again, I want to thank you all for um, following our webinar. You were very numerous again today. Uh, and thanks, uh, Professor, again, that was crystal clear, I believe. Thanks, let me just finish up with this again. My email address is malamid at usc.edu. You will receive a copy of the PDF from Septadon directly. But if you have any questions for me, feel free to email me and I will respond to you as soon as I can. So thank you all very much and stay healthy. Thank you.